Hello, this is Michael Reese. Welcome to Ad Hoc, a virtual talk series. I'm a sculptor and new media knot. I'm here to have fun and sharp conversations with some of the smartest people in art, technology, and sculpture. My interests and those of our guests will range far and wide and focus on making and the artist's role in our current era. We'll be talking to artists, curators, designers, and more. Welcome to Ad Hoc. Hello and good morning. And this is John Craig Freeman, of course, Michael Reese speaking with Craig. Uh, and we're just gonna chat a little bit um, in part about uh, your participation in synthetic cells, site and parasite. But more importantly, I think this is a great opportunity to introduce people to the richness of your work, you know, maybe to a newer audience. And, and you know, we've, uh, one of the sub, texts of the com conversations that I've been having is this idea of, a, you know, how people are working with three-dimensional data and AR all the time and has it, how it has such a sculptural presence and feel. And of course, in this show, um, you know, we're extending and examining the idea of sight and how sight might operate. And, you know, uh, Craig, I know that you've been on the forefront and, you know, working with digital media and for a long, long time. I wonder what your thoughts are about uh, three-dimensional data and sculpture and sight and, you know, just in a broad sense, what you see or how you, how you look at this media and, and what it's doing to dimensionality. Uh, okay, uh, I'll, I'll take a stab at it. Um, you know, I come... <laughs> to um, augmented reality uh, as a public artist first. I've been a practicing public artist since uh, 1990, since I completed my uh, uh, graduate degree uh, in 1990. And uh, I've always been interested in the idea of uh, leveraging emerging uh, technology to invent new forms of public art. So, uh, yes. you know, first and foremost, the idea of uh, making art in public space, it has its you know, traditions in sculpture, but also in space and place and right. the way that meaning is constructed in place. And so that's kind of where I come to the technology, you know, um, the, so it's this idea of kind of expanding our um, sense of, of place and also how like network technologies and mobile media uh, influences our understanding of, of, uh, of space and how it operates and how it constructs meaning. Is yeah, that a good starting point? Kind of? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And, uh, you know, to give a little background, uh, I mean, you've, you've been involved in a lot of projects. Uh, well, you know, first of all, you're one of the, there are four different artists that are in the show that are founders of Manifest AR. And of course, you're one of them. And, uh, you know, I think that's kind of an amazing uh, project and practice. Um, and, you know, I mean, I, I'd like to, you know, again, a kind of an open-ended question. Uh, you know, what what led you to to get started with that and organize people together? And you know, how did how did that all come about? Well, the group really came together uh, through the work of Mark Skowarik, of course, and uh, he's the one who first started kind of reaching out to artists that were working internationally, kind of early adopters in augmented reality, and so. Um, you know, him and my, myself and Will and Tamiko, we'd all been kind of in and worked in and around um, the uh, communities of, of, uh, of uh, you know, people working with emerging technology through, yeah. through uh, ICEA, for instance. I think I've originally uh, met uh, Mark at uh, ICEA in Belfast. I think it was maybe two, 2009 or so, if, I, if I'm thinking back, uh, Will and I were over in Belfast doing work um, it, it, around the Verta Flanner Zine project, which was this uh, uh, crazy attempt to set up a uh, pharmaceutical development company inside the virtual worlds of Second Life. So that's a different story all in itself. But uh, during that trip to Belfast is where I met Mark originally. He was uh, working in virtual reality at the time. He was doing this kind of installation work that was kind of looking at uh, charting the data being generated from uh, the stock market into these kind of virtual um, um, 
spaces uh, that would uh, change their, you know, ambiance and, and uh, aesthetic based on how well or poorly the stock market was doing, if I recall right. But, you know, Mark and I uh, began talking and, and you know, it, 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 about the potentials. He, this is right after he had done the, uh, uh, the BP logo hacking project, which was one of the earliest kind of uh, works of art in uh, uh, using augmented reality. This, of course, is kind of ignoring Jeffrey Shaw and some of the stuff that was done a decade earlier uh, with his Golden Calf project. But the, you know, it, it was this was right around the time that uh, augmented reality was becoming possible on cell phones, right. and uh, you, know, you know, so it was, it was it really did start to qualify as potential for making public art once it was available to anybody to view through their cell phone. So that's what originally kind of attracted me to it, and I, I think a lot of the early adopters, including. Chris uh, in his uh, uh, the work he, that he was doing uh, in New York and New Jersey and stuff with the uh, virtual public art project was right. right around that time. So we're talking about 2010. Yeah, right. And, exactly. and, and, and of course, uh, then Mark and Sandra Beanhoff had the idea of, uh, you know, getting all of these artists together and uh, uh, doing a, uh, a, a, a kind of intervention at the Museum of Modern Art called right. famously called We Are MoMA. And, uh, you know, where uh, he organized an exhibition at the museum uh, that the directors and the curators, of course, didn't know anything about and circulated the, the word of the project on social media. And all of a sudden, hundreds of people were showing up to the museum looking at artwork that the directors and the, and the curators didn't know any that was even there. And so early on, uh, the, the, you know, augmented reality as an art form kind of begged the question as to who was going to assert dominion in this new kind of virtual space that was starting to uh, manifest itself in our daily existence. So yeah. uh, the virtual space really, it's not an art proposition, it's a daily life proposition. You know, anytime we try and connect to a Wi-Fi network or uh, get a cell signal or navigate a city using GPS, it's, uh, we're engaging in this kind of idea of this new virtual space that in 2010 was quite novel. You know, it wasn't something we kind of really understood. And so it was a kind of street art gesture to kind of go into a place uninvited and create, uh, you know, a, a virtual art installation project and asking the question who, you know, were the museum curators going to be the one to say, no, you can't do that. And so, so it was, it was, uh, 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 you know, asking those early questions, which once the group formed shortly after the, uh, we are in, we are in MoMA um, intervention, we started working, not uh, necessarily collaboratively, uh, it, it, was, it was always kind of collectively. We were a group of artists doing different things, but we would come together in a global way using new network media, not just for the for uh, the distribution of the work through augmented reality, but also uh, you know meetings over online and that sort of thing, uh, and uh, using social media to alert people that the work was actually there because a virtual object in in physical space doesn't exist unless you know about it and know to go look at it. So there was this real fuzzy line between the artwork and social media itself, you know. Uh, but, we, you know, we started uh, going into, we would take a specific place or a specific event, whether it was, a, uh, you know, Tomiko helped organize the uh, Manifest CR intervention at the, at the uh, uh, Venice Biennial one year. And so we would all go in. I think that, that the, even the curators of the Biennial had uh, talked about this idea of kind of pavilion. So who got a pav pavilion? So that was the kind of theme of the Biennale. Even though we weren't invited, we kind of uh, uh, did our own kind of riffs on the idea of pavilions. Um, and, and uh, you know, so, so we come together collectively over a particular place and a particular issue, and then we would make work separately, but it was all kind of shown together in, in a kind of collective way. So, uh, you know, seeing that it's such an interesting issue, you know, that, that, seems to be tied so much to, um, you know, kind of the control of cyberspace and the fact that we're still in a kind of a very wild west kind of environment where we, we, we see territories being staked out in places like Facebook and Instagram, territories of control, right? And yet, you know, this augmented reality possibility, uh, you know, seems to cut right across the borders and cut across, do you think that this will continue to last as a, as a kind of a free space or a, a space where an individual user can be 
as influential in the designation of what happens in that space? Do you think that'll continue? Or do you think that people will, uh, you know, corporations and what have you will, uh, it's a naive question in a way, but, uh, you know, r rush in to, to grab control and grab territory? Yeah, so, so, so I've got a, uh, two different responses to that question. One would be that when we started asking the question of like the directors at MoMA, and then, you know, we kind of took that, that same question and posed it to kind of uh, government officials and, and, uh, and uh, uh, you know, government agencies and that sort of thing with further work in, in other parts of the world where we kind of go in uh, and, and see if governments would, you know, figure out a way to censor the augmented reality because they were already figuring out ways of, of censoring, uh, you know, Google searches, for instance. Yeah. Uh, but, but there was a kind of wild west beginnings to that. So what, we, what I think my, my answer to that question, who would assert dominion is clearly the big corporations themselves, the tech corporations and the telecommunication corporations, uh, you know, because they control the airways, so to speak. So, so it, 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 it kind of uh, making work that uh, engaged that dynamic uh, was a way of kind of pointing to the shift from the kind of nation state to the corporation as being the kind of arbiters of uh, uh, public discourse in a way. Yeah. You know, they, right. I think that the, that was an important thing that like Manifest They Are was doing at the time. Uh, uh, now, having said that, because um, clearly that now the, the, you know, augmented reality can be uh, not only censored, but it'll become littered with crass advertisement and just become another part of capitalism, be absorbed by capitalism, I think. Uh, I think that there's always a kind of a window of opportunity to uh, new media artists, artists that are working with emerging technology to uh, go in and be effective. And, and I've seen cycles of this in my own work. And, and I think that there's still, that window is still open in augmented reality, but it's becoming, uh, uh, it, 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 it's becoming, uh, more problematic than it was in 2010 when we first kind of, uh, it was so new at that point that people just didn't kind of understand it. Uh, if I backed up for, for like earlier decades now to work that I, that some of the earliest public artwork that I did using new technology was of course the uh, billboard project. It was called Operation Green Run 2 uh, at the nuclear weapons plant uh, in Bol uh, just uh, south of Boulder, Colorado. Right, could Rock you see the title once more? It, it's Operation Green Run 2. Right. Uh, you know, referencing this thing that the government did in uh, in the Pacific Northwest in the 50s uh, with radiation tests on un unwitting uh, populations. Uh, but Green Run 2 was this uh, attempt to kind of uh, draw attention to uh, the plutonium contamination that was a result of the manufacture of plutonium detonation devices for the nation's nuclear uh, arsenal during the Cold War. And the plant, the, it was the only plant that they made these plutonium triggers was just uh, about a mile south of Boulder where I was doing my graduate work at the University of Colorado at the time. And uh, I managed to, the, first of all, it was just when the early Macintosh computer was starting to arrive at the in universities. So, you know, I was uh, um, studying kind of, I'd come to the University of Colorado from UCSD where, you know, people like John Capra was the chair of the department at the time. I was studying with people like, uh, uh, like, uh, um, uh, you know, Eleanor Anton and yeah, Fred, right. Lon Eleanor Fred Anton, Lonadier. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Faith Ringgold. So, so it's a very kind of conceptual political art program, but, you know, it's always in the context of kind of conventional art education, paint, you know, study painting, drawing and photography. And, uh, but, you know, it, by the time I got to Boulder, it was right when all of a sudden they're bringing in, you know, Mac uh, two computers or SE computers, whatever they were at the very beginning. And, uh, and so uh, I saw it as an opportunity. Uh, actually, we brought one summer, we brought Esther Parada, who is a wonderful artist has pe since passed away. She was at the University of uh, Chicago, Illinois. Uh, uh, the, uh, uh, she was doing this work on an early Macintosh system where it was all about the, those are a body of work called the Monroe Doctrine, where she was taking these kind of historic issue images of, uh, of Central America and then kind of blowing them up with a program called Poster Maker at the time. But it was this idea of the most basic uh, digital image is this, you know, of course, made up of either black or white little you know, squares or, or, or bits of information, either on or off. And so that's the most basic digital image possible. And it was all that the Macintosh could kind of handle at the time. Uh, but, you know, she, she was kind of devising these ways of, of making images really large by dividing them up into, into little, uh, you know, uh, 
elements and then printing the elements out in on a standard laser printer that are still still in existence today in an office or you know you print out your files on a laser printer but you could take a large image and break it up into parts and then print it out on eight and a half by 11 sheets and cut them out and reassemble the images. So she was doing this kind of installation work where she would fill the gallery uh, with these really large images that you know had depth and stuff. But I saw it as a potential of kind of working in public space because it meant all of a sudden you could print out a digital photograph uh, the size of uh, you know, you know, world scale out there. You know, and keep in mind that it wasn't possible at the, even to, in those days to uh, print out billboards that you had to uh, right. actually hand. The billboards are hand painted at the time. The technology didn't exist. But right. I managed to commandeer 11 10 by 40 foot billboards that uh, went in front, right past the front gates of the Rocky Flats plant. And so I had kind of constructed this kind of image text panels that went for several miles on Highway 93. Uh, past the front gates of the plant, you know, it was right at the time when uh, the plant was being raided by the FBI for gross environmental mismanagement. So it, it was in the it was in the the media, but the media didn't have an image. And all right. of a sudden, these kind of day glow images of toxic waste workers doing the kind of rote repetitive task of uh, cleaning up, uh, you know, for the next quarter million years, two hundred fifty thousand years, the plutonium will remain deadly. So we're kind of roped at this. Kind of responsibility of cleanup for the next quarter million years or whatever yeah. it's uh but that also gave it an image uh that could be reproduced in media and it did you know it's all of a sudden the rocky flats had an image and so the, the image of the rock the, this in art installation kind of reverberated around the world uh in media so it was also an intervention not just in public space but also media itself right so all of a sudden you kind of interject this kind of image into the media and then it gets kind of reproduced into Spiegel and Time Magazine and, and so forth. So it's this idea of, so, of uh, media as a virtual space that could be intervened in. You know, I think this brings up, uh, you know, as people get to know you and your work and through this conversation, et cetera, I think it brings up something really important that, the, you know, the framework and the location of your work is extremely political. And you've always there's I've I've looked back over your projects. There's never, to my knowledge, uh, there's not never a project in which you don't have a sense of. Um, I mean, you talk about public art, but you're also talking about the the sort of the voice in the public square, right? And you're using that. Uh, you know, you you've set up a uh, you're using that in quite a critical manner, right? Examining, looking at the machinations of power. And uh, you know, commenting on and and making uh, making transparent thing or making a not transparent. I'm sorry, making available things that were previously hidden. You know, that's an important important aspect of your work and your project, right? Right. So it and uh, just a little kind of backstory on that. You know, in my art at UCSD during my art education, you know, I kind of became disconcerted with the kind of art markets and the in the role that uh, uh, commodity capitalism played in driving artwork because you know what get uh, what gets shown in museums are often the commodity that's most they can be collected and bought and sold and so it was a kind of rebellious kind of gesture on my part to that I wanted to try and invent uh, new forms of art that could function different differently and at the time I was uh, I, I was uh, um, I started, I, I was trying to do work about runaway development in Southern California at the time. You know, there's a lot of bulldozers out just kind of bulldozing up all of the open space around San Diego. And uh, I came across these, these uh, uh, Luis Sueño and Degueño pictograph and petroglyph sites that were overlooked the running water you know so it's spring in a desert environment there it's these yeah. kind of the red ochre labyrinths and mazes that were painted on the east faces of these uh both of these granite rock outcroppings that overlook the sp the running water year-round running water and they were getting bulldozed at the time so i started uh, this is kind of what drove my interest in drove me into an interest in photography it was just you know i wasn't it wasn't really about the photography but it's this kind of attempt to document these sites as, as they're being destroyed but in doing that i kind of started to understand that the that the art of these the of these older older cultures 
uh, function much differently than what I was learning about the art market in the museum and gallery system and right. the reduction of cultural uh, production to commodity capitalism. And so I kind of set out to invent a new form, but not trying to like chase, not trying to replicate these kind of pictograph sites, but this idea of kind of engaging space and creating a uh, uh, place by, you know, places where space is, is, uh, is, is uh, 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 you know, the me meaning is constructed out of space, it becomes place. And, uh, and so I set out to try and build a contemporary equivalent, right? So this is where the technology comes in because if the place becomes transformed, so like looking back at what constitutes public art in a conventional sense, it's monuments and memorials, often in the public square, right? So it's a place where uh, individual identity is, uh, like where national identity or collective identity is constructed out of individual uh, identity. So that's the role of the public square. And that's why we put monuments and memorials in the public square. But what's what was really clear in the early 90s was that that the public square, the public sphere and political discourse migrated from this from the physical place, the town square, into these mobile networks, right? So if an artist is going to be creating public art for a digitally networked future, that it had to engage this kind of virtual space that kind of chased after that migration from the public square onto these virtual net networks, the so kind of everywhere but nowhere of the internet and mobile phone, mobile devices and so forth. And so, you know, that, that uh, so th that that's all of the kind of, uh, uh, you know, that's been the, cons my, that's been the consistent uh, framework of how I've approached my work since those early days. Like I've always been interested in this idea of leveraging emerging technologies to invent new forms of public art to respond to the changing, uh, you know, the, the, um, the metaphysics really, you know, it's, it's really a different, different, yeah. you, you know, the, the, advent of these technologies uh, require a new cognition that that's right yeah right I, I would agree with that but you know i think that's really fascinating that you locate this in the I, i'm very uh very intelligent i think or very perceptive very sensitive to locate this in the petroglyph pictograph kind of space which it, I have a, i've you know have a little hobby or whatever of traveling to pictograph sites and and viewing them and just kind of, I love them in part because we, in many cases, in some cases we know what's going on in those sites and in other cases we don't have any idea at all. And so we're, we're looking at uh, something that is unmediated in a, in a funny kind of way. And I, and I thirst after that experience, you know, uh, and thirst after just kind of a, my opinion uh, there's lots written about these sites and lots of speculation made, and you can educate yourself to all of that speculation. But the truth of the matter is when you stand before one of those panels or what have you, your thoughts and your feelings, your emotions about what's going on in that panel are as valid as anyone else's because no one knows <laughs> what's going on. You know, there's no locating, uh, no primary locating, you know, signifier, you know, uh, which is pretty fascinating experience. You know, I got that same sort of, you know, again, I think it's quite interesting that you compare those two because when I came to working with AR, one of the things that fascinated me so much was there was no pretense to reality. It was by very definition and by experience, completely constructed. And because of our media savvy in this moment, uh, we, we come to it understanding that it is completely constructed. And so it sets up a whole other realm of discourse or conversation with the viewer that wasn't present pre previously. And I think that brings me a little bit, you, you actually introduced me to the work of Gregory Ulmer. And he's been a person that, you, that you've been very, uh, very engaged with him and very engaged with his theories for a long time, right? And as well, you're a professor at, at Emerson College and you teach them as well, right? Yeah. Can you talk yeah. a little bit about him, Gregory Ulmer? And... Uh, sure, the, uh, um, the, I just exchanged emails with him yesterday. 
uh, we, we continue to collaborate together. So my, my, ever since I, uh, you know, started my tenure track career at the University of Florida in the mid nineties, I've got my first assistant professor position there where he of course was a, 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 a professor at, in the English department, uh, teaching rhetoric and studying. He, he, uh, uh, the, 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 Entry point to understanding the body of Greg Ulmer's work over the course of his career is that he uh, invented uh, a theory of what he calls electricity. So it's a way of kind of understanding uh, the kind of cognitive um, uh, evolution that we're experiencing right now and drawing from the work of people like uh, Jacques Derrida, uh, who's you know, of course, wrote the book Grammatology, which is the science and and uh, techno the the the, uh, the 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 study of the transition from oral culture to literate culture, right? And that's been studied quite extensively. We know quite a bit about it, but where Ulmer's work uh, departs is he started taking the lessons of that transition from oral culture, where the collective knowledge and wisdom is being uh, uh, passed on by word of mouth. Uh, to the advent of alphabetic writing and the, and and uh, the, and how literacy transformed the thinking of the people and the institutions that uh, that uh, supported the technology and so forth. And so he started making predictions, and those, those in the mid '90s, you know, and those predictions have largely, uh, I think, uh, proved truthful now that we've got kind of actually seen uh, it unfold over time. But it's been my hope. Uh, ever since I started kind of collaborating him with various, well, we did this project at the Miami River back in the mid nineties that uh, uh, Bill Tilson was an architect at the time and Barbara Jo Ravel, who was chairing the art department. Uh, we started doing these kind of uh, field work down at the Miami River. And this was my first exploration into kind of prototypical, uh, like like proto virtual reality is the way I like to think about it. I was kind of looking at the at uh, games as a kind of form uh, for artists to kind of practice in again, like a window of opportunity, just like augmented reality or making billboards with really big images. Uh, There's this kind of window of opportunity. And so I started uh, developing this kind of notion about trying to document uh, this, um, uh, kind, of, kind of making a virtual document of, um, of some of the ideas that we were exploring, including the work of, um, of, um, you know, the Guy Debord and the, the Situationist International, we were kind of looking at them and their kind of notion of the derive kind of drifting through a space and trying to, uh, uh, you know, uh, identify what they call the Plock de Nanos. It's kind of turntable vortex, vortices where the uh, energies of a place come together in really kind of uh, interesting and dynamic ways. And just try and see if there wasn't a way of kind of following that through. Uh, uh, kind of spatial experience and then trying to make a form, an artistic form that could, uh, uh, could uh, uh, you, you know, bring form of the, really of the ideas of electricity. And, uh, and, and, and so, you know, I've been doing that ever since as well. You know, a lot of the right. idea is, uh, you know, uh, the, of, of that experience was that, that space, um, kind of can't really be understood through instrumental reason like we've reached the kind of limits of instrumental reason and so a place is plagued with problems and you can't solve the problems by continuing to kind of break them down into their constituent parts that the only way of uh, solving uh, an emergent pro problem is by being able to kind of uh, uh, understand the kind of holistic nature of being in a particular place and all of the, all of its history and all of the various kind of parts that come together to make it a meaningful place, right? And if you can kind of uh, uh, convey a kind of holistic understanding that there might be, I don't, I don't know if you solve problems, but at least be able to kind of look at them kind of differently or something. And I think that that's kind of the promise of electricity and virtual reality, frankly. You know, it's just kind of- you know, just, yeah. to, just to point out, electricity is a portmanteau Electricity is a portmanteau between electricity and literacy. Isn't that correct? Yeah, there's other references in there as well. You know, the uh, um, you would want to talk to Greg about that. Uh, the uh, um, it, the, the um, 
but uh, yeah, but yeah, it, it, it's a sweet, it's this way of kind of naming this kind of uh, condition that we were starting to experience in the mid '90s. Because before that, um, you know, that like uh, uh, Walter Ong wrote a book, the uh, 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 orality and literacy, where he was kind of looking at the same issue. But you know, it's, people started to use the word post literacy, which freaked people out, and and uh, or or uh, or secondary orality. Where these terms, uh, or or um, or um, that, the, you know, and, and there just wasn't a term to kind of describe it, really, right? The really the only way to kind of understand uh, the gravity of our experience that we were are currently going through still today is by looking at this transition that's already been studied, right? Because we know what it, how it affected the way people saw the world when you know when all of a sudden you didn't have to remember everything of collective yeah. knowledge, you could kind of write it down and put it in libraries, uh, you know, and then all of a sudden the, through, um, you know. But now the, the world is the library. You know, right. that's one of the it, things that it, augmented reality does for us is it like, it, uh, it turns everything into a link. Uh, you know, every single thing that somebody wishes to put their attention onto turns into a link. And, um, you know, I think that's one of the things that's always intrigued me too is, I mean, I think there's a memory theater aspect to augmented reality that's profound. And, uh, you know, it's, you know, if, if somebody's well read about a site or a place, if they're well informed or something, it's easy. Uh, when they go to that site, all of that knowledge is available to them. But now, easily and readily, just like the internet or whatever, any site could be filled with that kind of knowledge and uh, information. I mean, there's a, I mean, People talk about it as, you know, the difference between information and knowledge, and, but it's still, uh, it is information, but at the same time, it's full of knowledge because those experiences are tied to those sites, you know, it's just that simple. Yeah, the, the, and, and again, that the, um, the, uh, part of Greg's theory includes this kind of notion of Cora, which is an extension of the Greek term Cora. There's still a Greek word. I'm probably mispronouncing it to be asked, somebody uh, who speaks Greek. Uh, but this, the, you know, core is used to kind of describe a, um, uh, in its simplest form, it's kind of the next river valley over, but it's kind of everything uh, that's included within the valley. So not just the kind of plant, the flora and fauna, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the uh, uh, terroir, you know, the, uh, the uh, a wine maker would say it's kind of terroir, war. it's this kind of uh, the, everything that goes into making the grape just perfect or something, it's how much sunlight yeah. it gets. But the Cora also includes like all of its history, every story that was ever told at that particular place. Right. And, uh, and, and every, everybody who ever lived there kind of, right? Yeah. So it's a complexity of the holistic uh, experience, right? And so- It reminds uh, me a little bit of uh, Timothy, uh, uh, I'm, I can't remember if it's Morton or Horton, uh, but the hyper object, right? Right. The idea of a hyper object, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So, it, 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 yeah, it's, it's a sum of all of its parts, you know, and it right. really needs a new language, which, which is, uh, um, you know, so if you look at, at projects like the Border Memorial, right, for instance, it, it, it was an attempt to create a core out of all of Southern Arizona, right, where you know, uh, the so many deaths were occurring from migrants. Once, once the border was kind of fortified back in the 80s and 90s, and you know, it forced people to further and further into dangerous conditions to try and cross the the deserts of California, Texas, New Mexico, and and, uh, and uh, Arizona uh, in 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 more and more dangerous situations as the kind of city border crossings became kind of fortified and militarized uh, and, and caused many people to die just kind of in search and work and a better life. You know, the, the, and so that project kind of uh, took the GPS coordinates because the Pima County Medical Examiner would record the GPS location every time they would, would find uh, human remains out in the desert. So I managed to get a hold the negotiate that database and then I augmented every one of those thousands of data points or but but the bigger kind of picture if you kind of invite it you know that's a public art project that spans the entire southern half of the state right but it's this idea of saying that there's meaning inside in that in that uh space itself even when it's really quite large you know right and, right. and it's informed and by everything neutral, that happens seemingly neutral and seemingly sort of outside of everyday experience, you know, so almost unapproachable. And yet at the same time, here's all this very 
uh, local or located meaning. So, you know, it brings me to another issue. I mean, the, you have an enormous project. I mean, you're involved, you, you have a big, big view. In fact, I think, uh, you know, in your bio, you say, if Andy Warhol set out to create a distinctly American art form in the 20th century, I identify with those who seek to create a distinctly global art form in the 21st. And yet at the same time, uh, I mean, that's a very broad statement, very big, but I see you invested in many, many, many very nuanced, very complex arguments, you know, uh, or projects and in, engaging them at a very high level. So I'm always uh, delighted to, you know, think about your work and look at it and, and think about how you've handled this. Let's talk a little bit about, um, you know, in the background there behind you, is a virtual screen, a desktop screen kind of thing where you've got, uh, I think that's the Wuhan wet market that's coming by there. These are different projects that you've done, right? And they're three-dimensional scans, isn't that correct? Yeah, so, so I've had the good fortune to, you know, once I uh, started developing this idea of place and I started uh, writing grants to be able to kind of travel and, and uh, I was always interested in this kind of larger, like the work coming together in a kind of larger sense. Like if you're gonna make a virtual reality, you should make it global. And part of that is, is that electricity itself is of course a global phenomenon that we're engaging globally in a way that we have never before. And right. I think that the pandemic is, is one of the results of that, of course. But, the, uh, uh, but you know, I, I think it's important that we don't just leave uh, globalization to the, kind, to, to the financiers and the and corporations that artists need to be engaged in globalization as well. And I'm not talking about kind of international art where you have like these uh, people helicoptering in for the Basel art fairs or whatever they are, you know, the, uh, uh, to sell artwork that can sell anywhere in the world. You know, it's this idea that it becomes both global and hyper uh, local, which is, I think the, the thing that you're responding to. And so whenever I had the chance to travel to make this work, then I've kind of created this archive of these kind of virtual experiences and they've all revolved, they've evolved over time. It kind of started out just working with like forms of panoramic photography and video. And uh, so, it, I, but for the last you know decade or so, I've been working with the uh, uh, photogrammetry techniques, which is a way of extracting uh, uh, three-dimensional experiences out of the real world. So if, if I'm, it, so it's an attempt to bring the real to virtual reality in a way. And, uh, and so I did a project with uh, the Zero One Arts Incubator uh, back in, I'll make sure I get the dates right, uh, I think in 2016, um, the, the uh, uh, Zero One Arts Incubator, it's run out of Zero One, which is kind of in Silicon Valley, San Francisco area. They operate out of there. You, they used to do a biennial, but they kind of moved just towards uh, uh, administering programs, including the Arts Incubator. But the idea of the Arts Incubator, it's a, it's a State Department kind of funded cultural diplomacy program where they invite art, they fund artist projects in locations all over the world. And so the idea is that you go into a community and you collaborate with that community to kind of uh, uh, take a, uh, you know, it's based on uh, on Silicon Valley uh, art, uh, uh, like tech accelerators and incubators, right? So it's kind of like that, that kind of a model that you go and apply and, and uh, deploy as kind of cultural work uh, to kind of look at problems in individual cities around the, you know, cities and locations around the world. And you kind of work with the community to kind of envision you know, not solutions to the problems, but again, just kind of understand uh, the problems in right. a way, uh, you know, and so I was invited to do this in the city of Wuhan in 2016. Um, you know, the oh, larger... isn't, it, uh, isn't it kind of incredible that you went to Wuhan in 2016? You know, that... Right, right. so, so they, and it just happened that, you know, I ended up, uh, you know, I, I gave talks around at the museums and the universities around the city, city of Wuhan, and then we invited whoever wanted to kind of join us to do these kind of workshops where I kind of talked about how I did this, took this kind of choreographic, you know, approach to making augmented reality. And then uh, they assembled teams of, of, of groups of people from these various constituencies across the city. And then we had like a competition where they talked about the kind of work that they would do. We we're looking at changes in the city of Wuhan. And then, uh, and then we did these kind of micro grants to these 
to these community groups. And then I went out with the groups to the various cities where we would document their experience of change is the easy way to kind of look at it. And then we brought the work all back as augmented reality. And so it just happened that one of the spots that the, one of the groups took me to was the wet market where I had, had documented the, you know, long before the pandemic emerged uh, uh, out of there, out of there. But, uh, but you know, the, and so- uh, I was recently, in Wuhan in uh, 2018. And uh, I, you know, just thought it was an amazing place and was so impressed with the, you know, and the, the and I, I was in a couple of wet markets as well. I just couldn't believe them, you know, walking down the street and there on a wooden stump that they've chopped things a million times uh, was, you know, some, some morsel of food that somebody would buy and take home and make into a delicious meal. And I just couldn't believe it, you know, I just was amazed by it. Um, and, 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 and of course the culture, they, and, and again, if you kind of t take the terroir approach, you know, the, right. or, or the kind of choreographic approach to this, it's, it's, it, those are, are, it's culture, those wet markets are cultural heritage and now they're disappearing, of course, they're, it, which for reasons that are understandable for hygiene purposes and avoiding future pandemics and stuff. But, you know, these wet markets were the center of cultural activity in those cities, yep. right? And if you kind of, the, you know, the, I revisited the work just through the pandemic because of the kind of, you know, the, the nationalistic um, um, derision that was being cast upon the city, which I came to know so intimately uh, and re really still in touch with friends there, uh, you know, but the, the you know, the, the president, Trump's uh, derision of the kind of China using the terms like China virus and that sort of thing, trying to um, uh, just simplify a uh, city as complex as Wuhan and, and not understanding the, you know, the core graphic, you know, the, the topos it's called, the, the, you know, it's not just the, uh, the wet market, but it's the history of colonial uh, power brokering in the city of Wuhan, because it's on the banks of the Yangtze River, so that it, the city's made up of these uh, former concessions from all the colonial powers at the turn of the 20th century, that there was the Russian concession and the Japanese concession and the French concession. Americans never had a concession there, but uh, the, the we ran gunboats. You know, there's the, if you've ever seen the Steve McQueen movie, Sand Pebbles, it's about yeah. the gunboats running up and down the uh, uh, near Wuhan. Uh, but the concession was this kind of idea of a free trade zone where the emperor allowed the colonial powers to kind of take root in central in the markets of central China. And so um, not, uh, you know, understand that wet markets today and, and, you know, the globalization and its manifestation in pandemic can only be understood in the context of this history of global globalization. Right. So like yeah, one of the. Fascinating. fascinating. Yeah. The, the, if, the, if you the look at the one of the uh, sites that we that we looked at in Wuhan was the Russian concession that there was this it was called the Panhof House because it was the uh, uh, Russian tea merchant uh, built a palace there in in 1909 and um, and he became the richest man in China by trading tea to uh, in Russia and I have work from St Petersburg as well. Uh, but it's this idea that there's been this, we think of uh, globalization as something that's just kind of happening now. It's been happening all along uh, before the, the revolution throughout the emperor and all of the colonial powers. And now that same building has been the residence of uh, these kind of, uh, they're the homes for, for regular people. And so these families have been living in the Panhof house, like lots of them uh, since the uh, early 20th century, since the mid to early 20th century. And so that they have these kind of uh, uh, familiar uh, roots and foundations in this building that is probably, as you know, Wuhan is one of these cities that's going through immense and enormous, very fast paced change. Yeah. And so the, that kind of stuff gets lost, just like the, uh, just like the wet markets. So, so being able to kind of create the, the, if you can find a language to, uh, to, convey the holistic experience. That's the promise of virtual reality, both in its kind of, you know, uh, you know, insulated headset form and an augmented reality. Just the difference with augmented reality is that it can have this kind of, kind of correspondence with the real world. All right, that's fascinating. 
yeah. So, um, but you know, just just to be uh, a little bit uh, uh, basic about this, photogrammetry is the process of using photographs to stitch together to make a three dimensional scan. Uh, uh, sorry, three dimensional object in virtual or uh, in virtual space. That's essentially what photogrammetry is, right? Yeah, uh, most simply put, but it's worth kind of diving in a little bit into the into the technical aspects of photogrammetry. Uh, because uh, uh, the, the, in its most simple form, you just take hundreds of photographs, you kind of orbit the uh, people, place, or, th you know, or thing, and, uh, and uh, take a few hundred photographs, and then they put it, run it through software that will analyze uh, the individual kind of key uh, features of the image, and then, and then uh, uh, extrapolate uh, a three-dimensional, what's called a point cloud, from uh, the parallax difference between these key features from image to image. Now you can, they make scanners where you can uh, actually just drop a scanner out and kind of scan using pulse laser that balances and measures the time it takes the a laser, a point of laser light to make it back to the device and kind of extrapolate a three-dimensional object. But the important thing to understand here, I mean, I'm interested in it because I'm not interested in synthetic virtual reality. I'm interested in virtually virtual reality that's, in and of the real world and for the real world, uh, rather than a kind of game uh, type of virtual reality that's a kind of imagined synthetic, uh, you know, scene or, uh, you know, place. Uh, but the, that, that same technology that has to do with the idea of, of, a, of a sensing space is the same technology that allows augmented reality to anchor virtual objects in a physical space. So the, the newer cell phones have the ability to extrapolate uh, a kind of uh, dimension uh, in the scene that you're pointing the, the phone's camera at now. And the, even the most recent Apple devices actually have a depth sensor on board in addition to the camera. Um, wow. so, yeah. so, uh, so it's all interrelated. Well, LiDAR, LiDAR scanning, right? Right. It, so all of the technologies built upon those original efforts to try and extract, uh, you know, the, the, the technology that, that makes uh, photogrammetry possible is the same technology that evolved in to the ability of augmented reality to place a virtual object in, in a space that it could recognize at a GPS location or, you know, it, you know to recognize an image or now just the, the space itself can kind of be uh, recognized as a kind of anchor for a virtual experience. Right. Yeah, kind of a, amazing, yeah. Yeah, and so what I've been most interested in in the last you know five years or so is this idea of, of uh, creating a one-to-one -one correlation to the virtual experience where like you're experiencing the, vir the wet market but you're walking around it in your backyard or something or wherever, you know, it, it's not, it, it could be placed at a, at a specific GPS location, but the idea that the virtual experience itself is the same scale as the real world, it doesn't, a lot of what you see passing for augmented reality would be like a game on your coffee table or a sofa in the corner or something like yeah. that. I'm interested in these kind of immersive experiences that are have a one-to-one -one scale to the real world. Yeah, and I think your work especially has the feel of a portal. You know that you're in a place, but you also, and, and you know, right now the uh, this sort of uh, realism or the fineness of representation, whatever, isn't. Uh, and actually, I, I kind of love that about your work that you leave big holes and gaps, and and so the kind of collage that gets created is both the real space and this portal space that you're importing into the experience. And that's such an odd, I mean, I, I really get that kind of displacement and how valuable that is in when you're, you know, experiencing the work of art, because you get the sense of like, well, I can focus into the real space or I can focus into this other space. That other space is equally real. It has a different representation. But now that it's happening within the screen and everything is flattened anyway, then the ex both experiences are sort of equalized, right? And that's a fascinating, uh, you know, it, it, it's technical, it's technique, but it has implications for the way our mind works and what we see about things, right? Right, right. And, and so it, and in order to kind of back up a little bit more with heart history and a little bit of kind of theory of how, uh, uh, you know, my 
kind of aesthetic developed was uh, uh, Will and I uh, did some projects at the Los Angeles County Museum of Art. And uh, uh, this was when I first started doing the orators project. We were, it was called Artists Respond. And we were, the, Will and I kind of looked at with the collections at LACMA and we responded to artists, uh, particular artists work and then we made uh, virtual uh, augmented reality objects out in the kind of, uh, there's, there's kind of like a public, uh, uh, plaza area at LAGMA, if you've ever been there. Uh, yeah. But, you know, I was looking at the, uh, he's kind of an obscure uh, Russian constructivist artist, uh, 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 Gustav Klusis, uh, uh, famously assassinated by Stalin, even though he tried to, uh, uh, anyway, he was, he was uh, an artist in the constructivist tradition that had an interest in developing new forms of public art for the revolution, for the Bolshevik revolution, right? And he understood that the equestrian bronze or the marble statue in the public square, it was just too damn expensive, right? Uh, the, and and uh, so what you needed was a kind of new public art form that could be easily constructed according to instructions with common materials like wood two by fours or whatever you could get at the hardware shop. And, uh, and importantly, that it was this kind of idea to convey a new sense of national identity to a largely illiterate population. So this is the same driving uh, ethos that, uh, that Sergei Eisenstein invented the new language for film that we now call montage, but it was this kind of idea that a new language had to kind of be created. And so uh, Clusis was kind of uh, doing these wooden constructions that, that were uh, outfitted with all the emerging technology of his time. So he never built them, but he had these drawings of them. They would have like these kind of loudspeakers because the amplified sound was new at the time. Uh, they were seemed to be these kind of screens that would be except film, you know, as an emerging technology. Radio, uh, it was in the name, the orders, radio and propaganda stands. I think he called them in his drawings in Russian. Uh, but you know, so you could understand, you could real, you could uh, envision this kind of wooden sculpture, and it had its aesthetic, and it's kind of constructive, it's aesthetic. But you go ahead and symbol it out in the town square in order to kind of convey complex political ideas to a largely illiterate population. And so this is the same thing that um, Eisenstein was kind of doing with film. You know, when uh, you know at the same time that 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 uh, in the United States. Uh, 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 you know, the, a lot of film was just, uh, Ed Edison was like putting a, 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 an elephant up in front of a movie camera and electrocuting it to death for the spectacle of it, because what else yeah, are you going right. to do with a camera? You know, Eisenstein was figuring out how to create a language out of it by taking disparate uh, uh, shots of film and editing them together. And it was the juxtaposition, that kind of brute act of cutting and pasting two disparate scenes together. You know, the soldiers all raised their gun and the and the you know woman pushes her baby carriage towards the steps or whatever, and so the meaning is constructed at that juxtaposition, right? So that's how the a new language, which we just take it for granted now, uh, the right. film is, film it, it constructs its meaning. So this is a, just a long way of saying that it, you know all of us in manifest AR were originally kind of thinking of this idea of that that the equivalent of the the film edit is the juxtaposition of the world to the virtual experience. Right, the meaning can be constructed in that interstitial space between the real world. You know, the the and in those days, what everything we did was there's no marker tracking stuff. It was all uh, GPS. So we would pick the location and then we would put the object there. The idea is that the object would uh, construct meaning by the juxtaposition of the object to the place. Right. right? So. That's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. So, can you say the name of that artist that was working with the two by fours and the public? Space? Uh, this is Gustav Klusis, and you really have to dig to find it. You know, it was it was a, a, a How do you, you spell know, his a, last name. Uh, well, I mean the the uh, it, I, you see it spelled sometimes with a C and sometimes with a K, but a K K L U S. I'm going to blow it off the top of my head. Okay. Gustav right. Klusis, uh, S I S. Yeah. K L U. I'm sure people are going to want to look that up. I mean, yeah, that's just that, fascinating, you know. I, I mean, they, the original spelling is going to be in Russian, it's going to be in Cyrillic alphabet or whatever. But it's, I guess, sometimes gets misspelled in, in, uh, in, uh, uh, even on Wikipedia and that sort of thing. But, uh, but you know that word, those drawings of the you can sometimes find them. But it was you know just a kind of fluke that Lachman had in in their 
uh, collection. But he, he was Amazing. assassinated pretty early. He disappeared, I think, in 1928. Uh, just at the beginning of his career, uh, Stalin had him knocked off, you know. I was just reading about Thurman. And, oh, really? Know, wow. <laughs> and I don't know why, you know, just some kind of interest in that that whole development and how, you know, he sort of disappeared from the United States and was sent to, you know, kind of kidnapped to Siberia. Wow. I mean, that's a different political reality, right? Or, you know, or at least uh, one that we don't uh, see readily or easily. Um, but anyway, yeah, well, uh, Craig, thank you. I mean, we've been going on now for about an hour and, uh, you know, want to keep it to about an hour. But this has been really wonderful. And uh, I really, really appreciate your participation in the exhibition. And I also participate, you know, really appreciate you meeting me here today. Tell me again, uh, or tell tell the audience, if you know, if there is one, <laughs> uh, what is, how can we uh, find more information about you and your projects? What is the best local, what, what is the best site for you? Probably just johncraigfreeman.net. Yeah, okay. we'll do it, yeah. Good, good. And that has a lot of your projects. And uh, you're also a professor, right, at Emerson College. Do you have any of your, uh, I mean, I'll bet your students are just like uh, phew, blown away. Must be a real joy to be in your one of your classes and working with you. So, some of them like it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so are you working primarily with art students or do you have a, a or, or I mean, I would imagine that there are a lot of, uh, you know, it's kind of like the design school at Stanford, how it permeates every part of the university. I would imagine that your curriculum could engage many, uh, many other areas of the university. Does that happen for you? I, I, or? I, I, I try, you know, yeah. um, there's institutional barriers, you know, that electricity would say that we should change. Uh, yeah. <laughs> theory of electricity should say that we should take a closer look at. Uh, I teach in the, in the Department of Visual Media Arts, which has a very large film program. And, uh, and uh, you know, so, uh, but, you know, I, I, all my classes, I hope I'm teaching as forms of art, you know, you know, yeah. but with the uh, 21st century kind of forms this is what I like to think of, you know. Yeah, that's very interesting. Yeah, I, I would, uh, I'm ready to sign up. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm ready. To, I'm ready to come join you. I guess I got to go through an application process. Oh, well. Um, but you know, listen, I really appreciate your work. And I, and I think you're, you've got a great mind. And I, I'm really pleased to get to know you better partially through this project, but also just in general. And, uh, you know, congratulations. And uh, I look forward to more. So yeah, but, go ahead. I, yeah, I was going to say absolutely. And, and, and the same goes for me. I really uh, admire your work. And I really appreciate you inviting me to be part of the show. Yeah. And, and and I have enjoyed talking to you today. And uh, yeah, me too. To I'm so really, anytime. Yeah. Say a quick recap. Have you got any new projects on the horizon? Anything new that you're working on that we could watch for? The, uh, you know, the, I'm on sabbatical right now and it gives me time, but the problem is the pandemic, bravo, of bravo. course. Yeah, yeah. The, the problem is the pandemic. I had originally uh, intended to continue the work on the US-Mexico border. Uh, mm -hmm. has been a kind of ongoing project since uh, through the duration of my career, frankly, that I've always tended to, because I grew up on the border, uh, I tend to return there, but uh, I've been quite serious about it in the last like uh, three or four years. And uh, I started, uh, I did some, a, a large body of work, uh, both in virtual and augmented form, uh, at the uh, where the wall goes out into the uh, Pacific Ocean at, between Tijuana and San Ysidro, and uh, I went out and taught in at our campus in Los Angeles last year, uh, and it was my intent. I and I went through Nogales on my way out there. I drove out there, but the intention was to spend several months on the way back along to go along the border through. Um, the, the, you know, to drive the entire distance along the border and make this kind of virtual work as I went. And of course that got cut short from the pandemic. And so, you know, I kind of raced back here to finish teaching online. But um, so if the, you know, things improve with the vaccine and stuff, I hope to get back down to the border probably. I'm also doing some work on global warming and sea level rise around the city of Boston. So uh, I'm working hard at that. Anything at this point that I can do here in the studio without having yeah. to travel until yeah. things, till the vaccine is uh, available to all of us. Yeah, that's great. Well, listen, 
thanks again and i really appreciate our conversation today yeah and i, I look forward to seeing the rest of the recording so uh, yeah good, good on you guys thank yeah, the people good. at the at the sculpture center yeah hey you got your book right yeah i did it's wonderful okay good the, good excellent yeah. <laughs> very good just wanted to make sure okay man talk soon okay so long now take care yeah you too